Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. Welcome back, book lovers. Real quick, if you are enjoying the podcast and haven't yet subscribed or left a review, please do. It really helps me a lot. Anyway, let's talk about books. First of all, let's take a moment to talk about Eric Carle, who recently passed at 91. What an icon. He created something that can be immediately recognized just on sight. And what child has not been exposed to one of his books? He's the go-to for young children. I know mine adored The Very Hungry Caterpillar so much that we had a board game based on the book, even though Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See was their favorite. Eric Carle has impacted so many lives, and his legacy is just amazing. R.I.P., and thank you for your art and your words. So the book I want to talk about today is Nine Perfect Strangers by Leanne Moriarty who also wrote Big Little Lies, which is another book that I have somehow missed and need to read ASAP. And I feel that way even more after reading this book. I don't know how I skipped over this one for so long. I got this from Book of the Month back in 2018, and it ended up on the to-read shelf and got kind of buried and forgotten. Then I saw an ad for the Hulu show, or movie, I'm not sure what it is, and I decided that I should definitely read this book and then compare it with the show. So this book was perfect for me. It had a real, like, Road to Wellville vibe, which is a book by T. Karagasin Boyle. If you haven't read it, it is amazing. And there is a good movie version of it with Matthew Broderick. Although, honestly, I don't know how good of a movie it is because I haven't seen it in a very long time. But I do remember enjoying it, and the book is fantastic. Anyway, Nine Perfect Strangers is a modern and much more quick-paced book. I loved it so much. It starts with a heart attack. Two paramedics arrive to care for a stubborn businesswoman who refuses to admit that she has a health problem. And then she goes into cardiac arrest. Then we jump to 10 years later. We meet Frances first. She is an author of romance novels in her early 50s. And she has kind of hit a wall in her career while also simultaneously being swindled in an online romance scam. She's feeling so lost in life that she signs up for a 10-day wellness retreat that promises a complete transformative experience. There are nine people taking part in the retreat. Uh, There's a gruff old man, a young wealthy couple, a family of three with a jovial dad, a kind of severe mom, and their 20-year-old daughter, a lawyer, a frumpy housewife, and Francis, of course. Now, the wellness retreat is run by a magnificent woman named Masha. She was once the uptight businesswoman who couldn't slow down even for the paramedics 10 years before. She died and was brought back to life, and she experienced death, and it changed her completely. She changed her own health habits and now is doing the same for others with the help of a few assistants, including Yao, the younger newbie paramedic who was there the day of her heart attack. Now, some of the practices at the wellness retreat are a little odd, and there are a lot of rules, like no booze, no food, no electronics. Most of the clients rebel in some way or another, but they are soon drinking their smoothies and practicing Tai Chi, and most of all, for the first five days of their retreat, they are observing the noble silence. No talking and no eye contact. For five days. I think I could probably do that, but I do think it'd be pretty rough. So there are a lot of luxurious amenities as well. There's pools and a hot tub, a masseuse, and required facial treatments. Even the daily smoothies are tasty, and everyone seems to be adjusting well. Their treatments are working. But then one of them makes a discovery that changes everything, and things get kind of intense. (laughs) I love the characters in this book. Every one of them has their own backstory and pain and dreams. And their stories are unfolded little by little as we go through the book. I'm not going to tell you anything else about the plot because I don't want to ruin it. This book is incredible. And I can't wait to read more by her. 
including Big Little Lies, which I will eventually get to. And at some point soon, I will watch the Hulu version, and I'll probably do a reaction video for the Patreon. So if you haven't joined the Patreon yet, it's five bucks a month, and I'm putting new content on it all the time. You can go to patreon.com slash books and cats. Books, the letter N, cats. Now we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I will tell you about my cat's great escape. Hey, book lovers. I know I've said it a lot, but I love Prisma Text. I've been working really hard on my German. I am on day 306 at this point. And when I get sick of doing the app that is teaching me the language, I love to switch over to Prisma Text books. I love classical novels. And it's fun to learn a new language while also reading a book. They make it super easy. You can just click on the word if you don't understand it, and a definition pops up. As you go along, you need to click less. It's brilliant. So check out Prisma Text and use code Books and Cats, that's books, the letter N, cats, for 30% off your order. Start learning today while enjoying fantastic books with Prisma Text. Welcome back, book lovers. Okay, so let me tell you about the escape of everyone. It was a night out for the little cats, let's put it that way. So all of my pets had a fun night the other night, and I do mean all of them, even the dog. My husband looked out of our back door and found him just standing on the porch. He's a huge black dog. He can't sneak out. Um, and he never goes outside without us. So this was definitely shocking and confusing. We did eventually find that the basement door that leads outside was not fully closed. And smart boy that he was, he just let himself out. So he was only out for a little bit, but the cat stayed out all night. Except for Zeus, he's having his own adventures, which I'll get to in a minute. So like I said, the escape portal was the basement door, which somehow didn't close. And I woke up at, I don't know, 3 a.m.? to the sounds of Strudel at my window. She had a mouse in her mouth, and I panicked because my window was not completely shut. And honestly, I've had enough little animals in my room for a while. I don't need that anymore. So I jumped out of bed, raced downstairs to let her in, and on my way down, I heard Sasser's just freaking out on the back porch. She makes these high-pitched little, like, pew, pew noises, and she was so loud. So I let her in, I let Strew in, I couldn't find Weird, but I knew he was outside. Zeus appeared for feeding, so I fed the cats, called Weird again, and he comes sprinting up the backyard. And I just, I mean, he's my favorite anyway, but I just love it when he runs because he's, he's a long-haired black cat and he just is completely puffed out when he's running. And he just looks so happy. It's really adorable. <laughs> they were all so exhausted that after they ate, they all just camped out on my bed and slept hard. For the entire day. It was a recording day, and I definitely captured some of their snoring in the background. So funny. <laughs> so I do worry about them being outside because people drive pretty fast by our house. But Strew is capable, and so far Sasser seems to hate it, and Weird sticks to the backyard. So here's hoping that it stays that way. I have to say that life with cats is always an adventure. And speaking of adventures, my old kitty Zeus now has a daily habit of going outside. He loves it. He's gotten very adventurous in his exploration of the backyard. Yesterday, he kept running away from my kiddo, and it was hilarious. He honestly acts wilder now than he did when he was a kitten. Zeus is really just living his best life right now. So cute. This week's quote of the week is actually two. And they can both be applied to living your best life. The first one is from Fatima Mohammed, who wrote Higher Heels, Bigger Dreams. And the quote is, We each have one life, and we are entitled to living it on our own terms. I think that's really one of the hardest parts, accepting that you really are free to live however you want. There's a lot of expectations um, from family, society, friends, whoever. And... Um, None of it really matters. You have to do what you want to do. It's your life. You only get one, right? As far as we know, anyway. Um, okay, and so the second quote is from Mark Twain, and it is, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. And I love this quote. This has really become my mantra for life. I've never been a very good liar, which I do find it interesting that it was always said to me like it was a bad thing, 
that I wear my heart on my sleeve and my emotions on my face. But I think that's really just based in fear. Our whole culture is based on lies. Just look at social media. It's a highlight reel. So maybe not entirely lies, but definitely a lot of omissions. Anyway, I've come to the I don't care phase in life, and I'm a kind person, and I don't mean anyone harm, and so I'm going to speak my truth and be okay with it. And Mark Twain is so right. You don't have to remember anything when you tell the truth, and that's good because, honestly, I can't remember that much, (laughs) especially short term. I have to say I have definitely not always lived by this quote, but because I'm bad at lying, I've been caught in a lie before, and it is the ickiest feeling. Telling the truth may feel a little bad in the moment, but it's also freeing and good for you. So I'd much rather be uncomfortable telling the truth. Anyway, enough about this. I'm not really like a huge Mark Twain fan, but I do love this quote. So anyway, that is the end of the podcast. If you would like to check out bonus episodes, merch, and my other books, um, check out the website, booksandcats.com. That's books, the letter N, cats.com. We're just living our best books and cats life over here, and I would encourage you to do the same. Let me know what living your books and cats life entails, or send me book recommendations or cat stories. I really appreciate the um, Instagram story that I got tagged in earlier today with this gorgeous gray kitty named Thor. Little music. It was adorable. So thank you so much. It made my day. Keep tagging me in things. I love seeing pictures of cats. Also, stick around after the music and you can hear the next installment of my weekly writing project, Heart of the Storm. We're on chapter 22. And I have to say, it's getting pretty good. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep reading. Thanks for sticking around, book lovers. And now, chapter 22 of Heart of the Storm. Enjoy. A loud clap of thunder rolled over the valley. The fog was so thick that those that remained could barely breathe the air. Most had moved already to the southern forest and the homes of their natural witchy friends. The magic workers of the valley wove protective spells and built buildings of them to provide safety for their neighbors. Velen skirted around the edge of an encampment. The magical yurt had appeared as a shimmery silver mirage in the thick fog. She had been walking blindly for hours, trying to use the strange sounds in the fog to navigate her way south. The valley was not a vast land, but she had lost her way numerous times. The first protection area was not far within the edges of the forest. The southern forest was possessed by a gentle magic. Harmless. It was nothing more than a slight irritation to Velen. It buzzed on her skin like a mass of tiny insects. She swatted at the patches, but nothing helped. The warm glow of their safety drew Velen, and she stepped through the barrier without thinking about what could happen. Her skin immediately began to grow even tighter and more stretched. It burned, and the pain grew every second that she remained in the space. Her skin was beginning to blister and split. Velen put her head down and sprinted for the middle of the yurt. The valley dwellers turned as if in slow motion as she ran screaming into their midst. She threw her hands in the air, making her skin split painfully, and a small silver cloud was released. It grew rapidly and coated the ceiling of the room. Velen dropped wearily to the ground. Her skin cooled, but the pain grew worse. And then the screams began. The clouds emitted a glittery vapor with a soft hiss. When the first woman clutched her throat and dropped to the ground dead, the screams erupted and the peaceful valley dwellers began to run in every direction pushing and fighting and trampling the unfortunate ones who fell. Velen grinned as she slumped over. She saw the boots approaching. She closed her eyes and waited. What were you thinking? Keva was pacing in front of Harper's chair and had been lecturing her without pause for over 20 minutes. He was still buzzing with adrenaline from the moment that Lazalt threw him off before diving to catch Harper. The woman carrying Gemma had caught him easily, but he had been airborne long enough to see what a minuscule amount of life he'd really had. 
Harper had only spoken once. When Lizalt placed her chair gently on the ground, she looked around, and as she realized where she was, her expression went curiously blank. Oh, she said. Thank you. Lizalt nodded and bowed, but Kevo exploded. He'd been lecturing her ever since. Harper watched him blankly, giving nothing away. She wasn't listening to Kevo anymore. He'd said what he needed to say several times before she checked out, and she assumed he was continuing in the same way. What she was thinking about was the fact that her legs, though numb and useless, were fusing to the chair. She sensed a difference. Maybe the return of feeling, but it all came in vibrations that traveled through her blood. It wasn't her legs. She was becoming something else. She had surreptitiously tried to lift her dead legs with her hands, but she couldn't even slide her fingers between them and the chair. Her fingertips met with solid wood. Harper was furious. She could feel the thick black hate filling her. What was left of her, anyway. She raised her hand suddenly, and Kevo fell silent. Everyone waited, not breathing, for her to speak, to tell them what would happen next. I'm tired, she said softly. Kevo's face melted, and he embraced her and rushed her out of the room. There was no way for her to lay down, but she could recline. Kevo arranged her pillows and blanket, and she smiled at him. Thank you, she whispered. Kevo smiled and kissed her forehead. She closed her eyes drowsily as he quietly left the room. Okay, someone better tell me what's going on right now, he said firmly as he stormed back into the main room. Calm down, Kevo, Gemma began. She moved to him and took his arm. I know it's a lot. Just sit. Breathe for a moment. She's safe. He nodded and sunk down into a chair. He put his head in his hands and stared silently at the floor. After a moment, the gruff, green-hued woman cleared her throat. There is too much history to cover in one night, but I will do what I can. We have limited time. Your friend is safe for now. We all are. But it won't be so for much longer. Darkness has come to the valley. The woman moved into the shadows of the room, as if to hide from what came next. There were six of us. One too many. One too many for what? Gemma asked impatiently. We were young and so close. Like sisters. Because we were all different from the others in the valley. We had magic that no one understood, and most of the valley dwellers seemed to fear. They were not kind. Things are better now, mostly because of us. We bore the brunt of their fear and showed them what the magic could achieve. She sighed and leaned against the wall, fully shrouded in shadows now. No one liked us much, as you can imagine. Some did better than others. Lottie was kinder. She had a good heart. Had? Kevo asked angrily. He remembered Lottie, and while the woman had been somewhat cold to him, she had been kind to Harper. Yes, she's gone. We all feel it when it happens. The pain is excruciating, but we deserve it. Gemma exploded and jumped to her feet. Why? Get to the point and tell us what is going on. Fine. I haven't spoken much in the last two decades. I forget the subtleties of conversation. Gemma sighed impatiently. Anyway, we sisters were lamenting our lives one day. It was a perfect one. Bright golden sunshine, warm, lilac-scented air, blue sky without a cloud to be seen. Absolute perfection. We were sad at how many perfect days we would miss. How short life was, even though we'd already found a way to extend our youth well beyond what it should have been by then. Mina was the one who found the books. That weird old library she inherited has all kinds of useful stuff in it. Who knew? She laughed a little, but the laughter died on her lips. She showed us one book. All of us. It showed us how to perform the transformation. That was when Manx got involved. Mina bewitched him into performing the sacrifices. Of course, at the time, we didn't know how depraved he was and how he would warp it to his own strange experiments. Turns out Mina didn't actually find Manx. He found her. He needed the sacrifices as well to build his army. Do you have any idea how large this army is? Lizalt had been silent until now, and Gemma jumped at the sound of his voice. 
No, but I know he's been busy. One of his stands before us. Everyone was looking at Gemma now. She saw a gleam in Kevo's eyes, a look of understanding and murderous rage. Lizalt saw it as well and jumped up to settle Kevo before he could explode. Continue, he said hastily. The woman glanced at Gemma, who was staring at her hands and fighting back tears. There's more. The woman was pressed so far back into her dark corner that she seemed to be trying to become one with the wall. There was a second book. Mina didn't tell everyone about that one. She told the ones she trusted the most. Myself, Lottie, and Kiki. We were the ones who chose. Her voice broke then. It took a few minutes, but she regained her composure and continued in a rush. The second book had a spell. Supposed everlasting life. But there could only be five of us, and we needed a sacrifice of extreme power. We chose Thea. She gulped back a sob. We convinced Maz, though I don't think they were ever really behind the plan. They barely participated. We did the spell, we sacrificed Thea, but something went wrong. I'm not sure what. There was a chance that she could return through her daughter. No one knew about Harper back then. Thea and Manx had been married for years, but never had kids. Or so we thought. I feel sorry for you kids the most. Your blood is tainted. Every single one of you. Each sister had only one child. A special, magical child. Born with power and wisdom surging through their veins. And a curse. A curse you activated when you brought Harper that vessel. Now it is time for us to pay for our choices. We chose wrong. We were greedy. She sighed again and her wings lifted her into the air. I'm so sorry, Gemma. She flew from the room as the tears broke free. Gemma stood frozen in shock for a moment, then she scowled and stormed after her. Hey, she yelled. Mom! Her voice faded away and Kevo looked at Lazalt. Mom? They each had one. We are the children of death. We were born by the dark-hearted ones. Gemma was born from Numa. I belong to Maz. Harper is the daughter of... Thea, Kevo finished. And my mom... His voice broke off. Lizalt nodded. Kiki. That's four. Only Mina and Lottie are unaccounted for. There's two more? Kevo stood up and cracked his knuckles. He resumed pacing the small room. You heard Nume. They each had one. That's the other thing, Kevo said, pausing to think harder. I don't have any magical abilities or anything. I don't know if Nume is 100% correct about all of this. Lizalt shrugged. Well, we don't have anything else to go on right now. It makes sense, though. Haven't you always felt different? Notice that others treated you strangely? I have. The forest dwellers are not the kindest people, and it has not been an easy burden. I was homeschooled for a while, Kevo said. Then I went to high school and befriended Harper. No one messed with her. Lizalt nodded thoughtfully. Because they feared her? He asked. Kevo wanted to deny it, but he knew it was true. He'd been so focused on keeping her safe and doing his mother's bidding that he hadn't really noticed. Yeah, he said finally. After a moment, he sighed. I'm going to go check on her. Lizalt moved toward the other doorway. If you need anything, give a yell. I've always wanted a brother. He grinned and winked before vanishing from sight. Kevo shook his head, but he couldn't help but smile. He'd always wanted a brother as well. He eased the door to Harper's room open slowly. As his eyes adjusted to the dim light, he realized the room was empty. Harper and her bulky wooden wheelchair were gone. And that is the end of Chapter 2, book lovers. I hope you're still enjoying my weekly writing project, Heart of the Storm, and we'll continue next week. Until then, keep reading.